Hi everybody, Dana Show, editor of Civil War Times Magazine. I'm back with Melissa Lynn, director of photography, Eric Mink, ranger extraordinaire for the National Park Service, and we're also joined by another National Park Service employee. This is Louisa Dispenseri. She's a museum curator, and she's going to be showing us some artifacts, some cool artifacts here in just a minute. Before we get a look at those artifacts, uh, I just want to let you know we are across the river, and we're going to end up today one last segment. We're going to go outside of the house here and go look back across Fredericksburg, but we are in Chatham Manor, that large brick structure I showed you from the bridge landing site on the other side of the Rappahannock in Fredericksburg. Burma sidewalks the battle from here, and this was also sort of the Union Nerve Center for the engagement. And Eric's going to tell us a little bit about the house itself and, and the history, I believe, of the, of the structure. Well, sure. Yeah, the, um, as Dana said, we've come across the river, and uh, Chatham here uh, was uh, constructed between 1768 and 1771. And uh, during the summer 1862, occupation um, of uh, Fredericksburg and Stafford County, this side of the river, uh, this was Major General Urban McDowell's headquarters, um, and uh, uh, as well as Rufus King, uh, who was a division commander. Um, and uh, so the building was used repeatedly as a headquarters. And in December of 1862, this became Edwin Sumner's uh, headquarters, commanding the Bright Grand Division of Burnside's Army. And as Dana said, this is where Burnside witnessed some of the fighting going on across the river. Uh, the signal station at the courthouse was signaling back here to Chatham. Um, so we'll see when we step out that direct line of sight across the river. Um, but just as uh, the courthouse and the churches in town that we talked about uh, earlier today, Chatham also became a hospital uh, as the wounded were coming across uh, the pontoon bridge. The pontoon bridge location is just below us on the river, uh, below us uh, on the from the heights here, the wounded coming across, and this became a hospital. And the uh, Frederick uh, Dyer, who was um, a surgeon with the uh, 20th Massachusetts Infantry, uh, was in charge of uh, this uh, hospital here at Chatham. And uh, he, his accounts of, or, or his accounts of the. Uh, uh, the battle in this time here had been published in a great, great source uh, describing uh, the operations going on here. But the hospital here at Chatham operated from the 13th until the 21st of December. And it's difficult for us to be able to tell how many um, wounded came through here. Um, Claire Barton was a nurse um, who uh, worked here at Chatham. Uh, she estimated that there were about 1,200 uh, patients that came through. Um, another account indicated uh, more likely, uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, two to three hundred came through mm -hmm. here, uh, perhaps. So somewhere in, in around, and perhaps even in between those ranges. Uh, but the room that we're standing in is the largest room on the first floor. You want to just kind of uh, spin around? Really, uh, and this is the one that has been traditionally interpreted as being the surgical room. Okay. Um, and uh, here at the end of the hallway. And uh, so it's quite possible that this room was used for surgery. For surgery. Yeah. So Walt there, Whitman was a, a, came down after the fighting looking for his brother and stayed on here at Chatham to help take care of the wounded. I was going to say, I thought Whitman was yeah. a nurse here. Yeah. Uh, and in his book, The Wound Dresser, he talks about uh, the amputated limbs being tossed out the window and piling up around the base of two trees. And just outside the window here are two Catalpa trees uh, that do date to before the Civil War. And so it's always been the traditional interpretation that Whitman was talking about those trees. So, so I, again, that lends to the interpretation yeah. of this room as the surgical room. Are people picking that up without our mics? We've had a couple people say they can't hear it okay. as well. well we are using mics. We don't have enough mics to go around. What Eric was saying is that this may have been the surgery room here at Chatham. Walt Whitman was a nurse, and he wrote about limbs being thrown out the window around the base of two trees. And there are two very old Catalpa trees out the window 
Maybe, again, leading credence. So we'll, we'll go over that again when we're outside in case you missed it. But just, you can see this marble mantle that shows you the, the wealth here that was in Chatham. And this was a very fancy manor house, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so the, um, uh, the uh, house was uh, continuously lived in as a private residence until the 1970s when the Park Service uh, took over uh, possession and opened it to the public. Um, but uh, again, this has been interpreted traditionally in this room as a surgical room. And so Louisa has um, pulled some artifacts out. Louisa here, the artifacts. So Eric, you want to talk too, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so now that um, Eric has sort of provided context for the space, I just wanted to show off these two or three objects. Um, so this first one here is a Model 1840 non-commissioned officer sword. Um, and typically when we describe swords, we break it up into two parts, uh, the hilt and then separately the blade. Um, so the hilt here, um, it sort of features a brass ball-shaped pommel and a flat brass knuckle bow and a straight cross guard um, and double sort of kidney-shaped counter guard down here. Um, and the brass grip here is meant to sort of mimic wire-wrapped mm -hmm. uh, brass gripping, um, but it is all metal. Um, and then underneath the cross guard, and I'm going to lift this up here, um, is the inscription uh, FBH. Can you make that out? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so just some markings on the sword. Um, and uh, the second part here is the blade, uh, which is a straight sort of single edge, um, and it's made of iron. It's approximately 32 inches long. Um, and it features a couple of markings. Um, the first one here, and you're going to end up seeing it upside down, but it reads US JH 1861. And JH is likely the inspector. On the other side is um, the manufacturer's mark. So you'll be able to read Ames Manufacturing mm. Company and um, Massachusetts, where they're based out of. Um, so you might be wondering sort of why we're talking about this edged weapon in an amputation room, and it really wasn't used for amputation. Um, but uh, I want you to recall back to the FBH um, initials, uh, or marking, um, and because they're the initials for Franklin B. Huck, who was a surgeon in the 97th New York. Um, and he was uh, born in um, 1822, um, and he went on to get his MD from Western Reserve College in 1848. Um, he enrolled in Albany and mustered in as a surgeon on July 3rd, 1862. And locally, the 97th New York participated in the Battle of Fredericksburg. And as Eric mentioned, um, there were many casualties um, during the Battle of Fredericksburg, many of whom, uh, Union, were brought to Chatham for care. Um, and uh, Huff uh, served about three years and obtained this uh, sword most likely for um, a regulation, um, not necessarily for use. Um, and after his military service, he authored the 97th New York's um, history entitled History of Drury's Brigade, um, which was published in Albany in 1864. He also became the first chief uh, division of forestry in 1876, mm. uh, which is the U.S. Forest Service as we know it today. Um, Huff also brought back with him this sword uh, down here. Um, and it is a Confederate cavalry saber, um, and it has a accompanying scabbard here as well. Um, and so the hilt is pretty simple, um, and it's uh, a um, brass pommel, knuckle bow, and cross guard with a leather um, wrapped uh, grip that is wrapped in wire about 14 times. Um, and the knuckle bow is an extension of the pommel, and it's a single piece with three branches that he, down here. Um, that all connect to the oval cross guard. And the pommel is pretty simple. It's sort of of this helmet style, um, sort of like an ancient Greek helmet style is how we typically try to describe it. Um, the blade is um, a single edge as, as similar to the other one. Um, and it's unmarked, unlike um, the other sword we just featured. Um, and it has a curved um, edge uh, with a true edge and a false edge. And it's also um, a, a a um, false edge as opposed to a clipped point. Um, and then the scabbard um, has uh, the typical throat and two carrying rings, and then this is a drag end mm. as well. 
So he might have brought that home as a souvenir. It's possible. It's really hard to say without any markings mm -hmm. on um, the saber. Um, but yeah, it could have been looted, some sort of memento. We're not sure. Okay. And then um, but the two swords uh, were sort of preserved in the family's history, okay. just by descendants. So nice. that's sort of a word of mouth story about um, the Confederate sword. Uh, whereas we're pretty confident um, in the uh, non-commissioned officer okay. sword. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't a descendant that donated the sword to the park. Um, it was actually an unrelated private individual. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then you have brought out some really interesting watercolor paintings. They're actually oil paintings. Oh, oil paintings, <laughs> excuse me. It's okay, everyone thinks they're watercolor. Okay. Um, but yeah, so these paintings, or well this painting is one of a set um, and it's a familiar view uh, to anyone in the Fredericksburg area, um, so I'm sure some of those steeples look really familiar right, to Right, and we were just over there talking about all these things, Louisa. Yep, so right there, the courthouse. Mm -hmm. um, so is this the courthouse? I believe so, because this would be St. George's, or no, this okay. would be the Baptist Church, and then St. George's is too far uh -huh. um, out of view. So we were in this cupola mm -hmm. uh, earlier, Melissa and I, that's the courthouse. Yeah, so um, these paintings were painted by George Leo Frankenstein, um, and uh, according Not the Frankenstein. Not the monster. Okay. Okay. <laughs> we're all holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, he um, was with the commissary department, um, and in 1866, he wrote to the Secretary of State asking him to support a rather ambitious project of uh, documenting the landscapes of Civil War battlefields in the immediate aftermath of the war. Now, I don't know if there was actually a signed contract or anything, um, but ultimately about 33 paintings were a result of this effort. Um, and then in uh, 1949, uh, 24 of them were donated to the National Park Service at large, and then the service uh, sent them out to the respective parks where oh, they okay. belong. So we ultimately received eight of them. And I've seen, I mentioned, there's one, there's some at Gettysburg, and the other, yeah. So that's amazing. So he said, hey, government, I want to paint battlefields, pay me, and they did. I don't think you're getting away with that today. So he went out and painted really very shortly after the war. Yes, yeah, immediate aftermath. Um, and uh, I really like to feature these paintings, um, not just because it's, it's similar to what we're looking at today, it's a view you've seen earlier today, but um, it's sort of this idea of art as preservation. Mm -hmm. um, and I think one of the better examples of that is, it's gonna, I'm going to forget which one it is, is um, this one of uh, Widow Taps Cabin on the Wilderness Battlefield. Oh, that's cool. Widow Taps Cabin doesn't exist anymore, like many Civil War structures. Um, but this is one of the only images we have oh, of Widow man. Taps Cabin. Wow. Um, and it's featured, this image itself is featured on the Wayside exhibit that we have out there. Um, but just this idea of art as preservation is one of the main reasons I really like these. Isn't the Widow Tap the one that came out mocking the Union troops as they were No, 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 that was um, Permelia Higgerson. Okay, Higgerson. But, okay. but Louise is correct. That is the only um, image of the Tap Cap. That's awesome. That we know. Yes, that's so cool. Well, I'm glad... You know, the feds paid them some money, right? <laughs> I don't know if they really did, but... <laughs> well, show us a couple. Can you show us another one? They're yeah, really cool. so there's seven of them. So this is um, the Wilderness National Cemetery. Oh, wow. If you don't mind pulling them all out, huh? Yeah. yeah okay. um, and then this is the Chancellor House site. Do you want me to lay them out, or is this okay? That's okay. Yeah. So the Chancellor House site, also part of the park. Um, oh, wow. But does not exist anymore except for the foundation. Wow. And the ruins, that's so cool. Mm -hmm. And then here we have the site of Jackson's wounding. Um, so it looks very different today. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously with the visitor center there. Wow, yeah. Um, and then uh, this is the Spotsylvania, Spotsylvania Courthouse. Amazing. Wow. And then here we have, um, uh, still in Spotsylvania, but the Spotsylvania Hotel and sort of other adjacent okay. buildings. And then Widow Taps Cabin, mm -hmm. which we just showed you. And finally, um, this is Todd's Tavern. Oh my goodness, that's neat. Oh, wow. That's not there anymore either. No, it's not. Uh-uh, wow. Also oh. along the Wilderness Battlefield. Yeah. Right? Fantastic. That's great. 
I think your point is extremely well taken, you know, <laughs> the you. preservation through these paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, I think that pretty much wrapped up for you, Louisa. Okay, and we'll step outside here in just a few minutes. So if you want to all join us for our last little broadcast, we're going to go outside on the lawn of Chatham and look back across at Fredericksburg and kind of point out some of those cupolas and spires that we saw earlier today from in town, all right? Until then, this is David Schoen and Melissa Wynn, Eric Mink, and Louisa Dispenseri again. Make sure Louisa gets uh, some air time before we leave because she's the only time she's going to be on. <laughs> and thank you so much. And the thing is, folks, you know, the museums are closed right now because of COVID pretty much. So getting to see these artifacts, even for myself, is really cool. You know, and I really appreciate you taking the time to bring them out and those great stories and those wonderful okay. oil paintings. No problem. Okay. All right. So we'll see you in just a few moments, okay? Thanks, everybody. <laughs>